So the macroeconomic context uh, and can international supply chains achieve sustainability in a volatile landscape? Okay, uh, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, so guys, this is your reality. Okay, uh, you sit in, in the middle uh, of these three um, countervailing forces. You have to be aware of the external environment. I'm going to talk a little about, a bit about that from an economic perspective today. Uh, over the last two and a half years, uh, and indeed before that, uh, you had to think about supply chain integrity. Uh, we all know as uh, procurement and supply chain uh, professionals that nobody really worried about uh, procurement and supply chain uh, before the pandemic uh, because it worked so well. Okay, you did your job so effectively, supply chains worked uh, superbly, uh, it was under the radar, uh, and then all of a sudden um, all bets were off, uh, supply chains uh, were fractured, there were a lot of supply chain challenges, and all of a sudden supply chain and procurement becomes front of mind. And then obviously uh, we have sustainability goals, it's the reason why we're here today, uh, and you sit in the middle of that. Okay, so given the challenges of the external environment, given the need to maintain supply chain integrity, and given our objectives as far as sustainability goals are concerned, what does that mean for procurement uh, professionals? So, um, those of you who have seen me uh, speak in the past would now think, well, this is the point at which John puts a lot of numbers up, but I've changed post-pandemic, okay, and we're going to do it today uh, with pictures, okay? So many of you, uh, and there are a number of uh, young people uh, in the room, that's people who are looking forward to their 50th birthday, uh, haven't experienced inflation uh, in the past. Uh, you think you've experienced inflation, uh, but you haven't. And now you're just for about the first time in your life uh, going to experience inflation, uh, which is above 2%. Uh, there are a number of people in this room who think that inflation is above 2%. It's an absolute tragedy and the world is going to end. By the end of this year, we're going to be looking at inflation uh, in the United Kingdom around 10%, and we see that inflation uh, across the globe. Okay? Uh, inflation, interestingly, that is, being that is being driven by cost pressures, not demand dragging uh, prices up. So what we see is uh, fractures in global supply chains, increasing our costs, uh, input costs going up, be that uh, fuel costs, uh, be that food costs, uh, driving prices uh, aggressively in a way that they haven't uh, in the past. Okay? The danger is then that what happens is because of a cost of living crisis, that consumption in our economy, which drives a lot of the UK, North American, Western European uh, advanced economies, consumption is you know, 70, 80% of total demand, so that's household consumption, uh, will decline and that will drive us uh, into recession. Um, I'm a little bit, um, any of you who've heard me speak recently, um, I'm not so sure that the, 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 suits, uh, the, suits, the dooms sayers who are, who are suggesting that we will go uh, into recession at the end of this year have actually got it right. I think what we'll see is a significant reduction uh, in growth. Whether we get two, two consecutive quarters of negative growth, uh, I'm not so sure about that. And why am I not so sure about that? Because something is going on in our labour market uh, that is not normal, okay? Or at least it's not normal uh, for economists uh, like me. So you see that we are hiring job, join us, vacancies, welcome uh, picture at the bottom. We have a situation where um, employment is very, very high and unemployment is very, very low. And those of you who, and, th and this is true of many, many uh, advanced economies. So we have a situation where labor markets are incredibly tight, okay? Now, in the past, that would have led to an acceleration in wages as the power of trade unions increased and they used that power and tight labour markets to go in and ask for significant increases uh, in wages. Okay? What is actually happening, uh, and there is more evidence of this, is the wage acceleration is actually coming from the buy side of the labour market. 
So it's not trade unions that are going in and asking for increases in wages. They are, but trade union power has been uh, reduced. It's actually on the buy side, it's employers going out in tight labour markets and accelerating wages in order that they can bid labour uh, into their organisation. So if wages accelerate, that's what's likely uh, to drive it. This then, if we go to the right-hand side of the slide, uh, starts to introduce a whole series of uh, ideas uh, that are coming back into favour. Um, and I included this because you're going to hear this stuff. Um, uh, I, we've not really heard it for about 40 years. So I'm listening to economists talking on the radio saying, what should the Bank of England be doing if we've got increases and in inflation of 10%? Because remember, the Bank of England is charged with keeping inflation at or around 2%. In fact, if it's plus or minus 1% around their 2% target, they have to write a letter to the Chancellor explaining what they're doing about it and why they think inflation will come back in to those bounds okay so obviously we're well outside those bounds and then the economists come on the radio and they say the Bank of England should start to increase interest rates because it has to influence expectations and everybody starts talking about this notion of rational expectations which I haven't heard for 40 years so if you go back to when I was an undergraduate, we were told that if the Chancellor comes in and announces that he's going to reduce inflation because there's a whole series of policies, that people will listen to that and develop a rational expectation that inflation is going to go down and they will limit their wage demands going forward. Okay? It's an absolute load of junk okay, and nonsense. Rational expectations do not work in that way. Don't believe me, believe Robert Schiller. Okay, Robert Schiller, the Nobel Laureate, for sake of, you know, full disclosure, whose major ta text is irrational, or, or sorry, exuberant uh, expectations, said that economists who adhere to rational expectations model of the world will never admit it, but a lot of what happens in markets is driven by pure stupidity, or rather inattention, misinformation about fundamentals. Okay, and an exaggerated focus on the stories that are currently circulating. So I don't think it is appropriate for the Bank of England to go in for significant interest rate increases. Please, somebody explain to me how the Bank of England increase in interest rates is going to cause the price of gas to go down, the global price of oil to go down, the global price of wheat to go down, because there is a war in the Ukraine. Okay? So all of this stuff is stuff that you're going to hear uh, a lot about. And then the last piece uh, in the labour market that we need to think about is the Great Resignation. So part of the problem that you have, frankly, is people of my age uh, leaving the labour market uh, because they can. Uh, I heard an economist last night saying that we're going to see an increase in disability claims, okay? Uh, because people are leaving the labour market and they're going to claim benefits in order to fund it. I don't think that that's the case. I think what we're seeing is the end, the tail end of the defined benefits pension schemes. Okay? So essentially, you've got people of my age and slightly younger, I'll be 60 at my next birthday, okay, um, who now have defined benefits pension schemes, who've looked at the, the um, two years of the pandemic and said, enough. I'm cashing my pension in, I can afford to retire, and I'm going. And if you look at the statistics, it's the 55 to 60 year olds, okay, they're about 250,000, 260,000 of the 420,000 people who have exited the labour market post pandemic in the United Kingdom. Okay, so we've got a lot of stuff that's going on in the background that you guys, you guys have to work in that environment, okay? And of course, as we get cost of living crisis, as we get the threat of inflation, the danger is in a sustainability context that the pressure comes on you guys to up the importance of price, to up the importance of reducing costs uh, in your supply chain, and to what extent does that operate uh, against the sustainability agenda in the minds uh, of, the, of the uneducated as far as this is concerned. 
So we have organisational resilience, tensions, you have to meet productivity and efficiency goals, you have to keep pace with technology, uh, new business models and consumer trends. Consumer trends are definitely driving you uh, towards a sustainability uh, agenda. Uh, there's the regulation uh, environment that you have to deal with and, and, and standards and meeting new rules and then you have to respond to challenges uh, and take on ownership of emerging problems and boy have we done that over the last two uh, years and the fact that procurement is now uh, demanding a seat, the fact that supply chain is now demanding a seat okay in the boardroom is down to the fact that you have provided creative solutions which have driven uh, many of your organizations through the pandemic so we know what the supply chain challenges are as we move to a second bubble there's the the you know the the, the occasional you know evergreen uh, blocking the, the Suez Canal uh, there are fires in chip factories uh, there's environmental degradation uh, you know Glenn is here, he isn't going to um, waste an opportunity to mention the B word, but bottom right we have the Brexit uh, issue um, and, and dealing with that. And then we have the issue in Covid uh, in China and the Chinese ports closing, causing shortages in the supply chain, but also having an impact on the logistics uh, and freight forwarding business. And then most obviously, uh, most recently, we have to deal uh, with the war in Ukraine uh, and the challenges that that uh, puts uh, in front of us. We know also going forward there are future risks that we're going to have to manage in terms of our supply chain and integrity. This is, uh, some of you may have seen this in previous presentations that I've done, this is a McKinsey's uh, graph where on the vertical axis they look at the impact uh, of a disruption uh, and on the horizontal axis they look at our ability to anticipate uh, that uh, particular disruption. So the further to the left we are um, on the horizontal axis, the less time we get in terms of uh, being, being aware that the disruption is coming, uh, the, the more vertical we are on the axis, the bigger impact uh, that it has. Uh, for me, I've said it again in a number of speeches that I've had, I think going forward one of the things that you're going to have to manage is systemic uh, cyber attacks. Uh, I think our businesses are looking at that all of the time and now if we take that into the context uh, of a war situation and a particular uh, and, and a potential response to that, I think it's something that organisations have to think about. We've dealt with extreme pandemic, we've seen the cost of dealing uh, with that extreme pandemic that, that goes into trillions, okay, we did get a little bit of time, a little bit of time uh, in terms of weeks to prepare for it. Uh, and then we've seen the impact uh, of local uh, military uh, com conflict. So again, I think this is a useful uh, schema to look at in order to think about uh, the potential risks that we have to manage in our supply chain uh, and the, the time that we're likely to get uh, to be able to, to respond to it. As far as supply chains and, and sustainability are concerned, uh, this is a World uh, Economic Forum paper um, that I've uh, referenced uh, in the past, looking at the net zero challenge and what the opportunity is for su supply chain. Okay, and, and essentially, you have the capability, both in the procurement and supply chain context, to be real game changers uh, as far as um, climate change is concerned. So eight supply chains account for more than 50% of CO2 emissions. And if we would, the interesting thing as far as the World Economic Forum is concerned, is if we were to decarbonize these, these the impact on costs is pretty limited, okay? Now, you could argue, and we could have an argument about this because the, the, the organizations that are, are likely to engage in this behavior are likely to be innovative, are likely to be productive, uh, but that's where we have to take our organizations if we're going to be able to play in this game. So uh, who are the eight uh, supply chains? It's food, it's constructions, it's FMCG, it's fashion, electronics, automotive, professional services, and freight forwarding, okay? So by choosing your freight forwarder, by choosing a, 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 a zero carbon option, and there are zero carbon options out there, okay, we can make a, a contribution uh, to, to sustainability. 
Key things that they talk about in that paper, they talk about eight or nine things that we can actually do. I've just taken out four. Revisiting product design choices, reconsidering geographic sourcing strategy, ambitious procurement standards, and working jointly uh, with suppliers to co-fund abatement levers. Key issue here is that we go back to this theme that we come back to again and again in conferences like this, is procurement has to be embedded in the strategy of the organisation. Procurement has to be involved in the strategic conversation early on if these things uh, are going to be addressed. It is not about bringing procurement and supply chain professionals into uh, the conversation after the strategy uh, of an organisation has been developed. Otherwise, our ability to act on these levers uh, is severely limited. Okay, it requires, I would argue, a mindset change or a mindset challenge. So we're going a little bit left field here. In my, uh, my work at Cranfield, not only do I do economics, but I work uh, in, in, in the area of strategy and work with lots of organisations in the area of strategy, some of them supply chain organisations. Okay? This is a, is a paper and a book that I use a lot. Uh, it's a, a paper originally written by Donald Soule, uh, published in the Harvard Business Review in 1999. Why good companies go bad? If you want a copy of it, please ask me uh, and I will circulate it. Just don't tell the Harvard Business Review. Okay. Um, simple point that they talk about here. Uh, environmental change over time is what is being asked of us as organisations, including a sustainability agenda. Seoul's opening point is the problem is not that organisations are not aware of the challenge that is in front of them. They are aware of the challenge that is in front of them. They do know what is being asked of them, both in terms of a commercial and sustainability uh, agenda. The danger is that the rate of change of our organisation does not keep up with the rate of change of our stakeholders and what they're asking of us. So the red line does not keep up with the blue line. Okay? And what we actually end up with in phase two is what's called a strategic drift, a difference between what it is that we're offering as an organisation okay, and what it is that our stakeholders are requiring of us. What do we then do? Okay, before I go on, think of an English person ordering a table in a French restaurant. What do we do? We go in and we ask for a table in what language? English. And when it doesn't work, what do we do? Pigeon English. Yeah, yeah, we go into Pigeon English, we go slower, and we talk louder. Yeah, and Monge 2-2, two, two. yeah, Del Boy. Okay, so we repeat those strategies that we think brought us success in the past. Okay, so Saul's next point is the problem is not inactivity. What he argues is the problem is lots of inappropriate activity. So there's lots of activity, but the organisation isn't going anywhere in terms of meeting its stakeholders' needs. And therefore, he coins this term active inertia. Lots of activity, but we're not closing that gap in terms of our stakeholder needs. So what is he... Th and, and then, in the fourth phase, we either get it right, transformational strategies, how many people in this organisation have got transformational strategies, sorry, in this room, have got transformational strategies in their business at the moment? Have got the word, yeah. Transformation is everywhere. It's kind of like a buzzword, yeah? We can't just have a strategy, we've got to have a transformational strategy. Please don't ask the question, what is the difference between kind of a bog standard strategy boss and a transformational one? Okay, transformational one is when you, 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 you uh, close that gap, you close that strategic gap. If we don't do it, ultimately our organisation becomes irrelevant and may demise. Okay, so what are the drivers of this act of inertia? This is the key point for you and I think it's the key point in terms of the sustainability agenda. And it's the difficult stuff that you have to do. First of all, our strategic frames become blinders. So the way in which we think about the world strategically 
does not evolve to meet the challenge that is in front of us. Our strategic frameworks are not appropriate for the challenge that is in front of us, and in, in this context, the sustainability challenge that is in front of us. It requires a change in mindset in terms of how we think about strategy going forward. Going into a much more operational context, the processes, the systems that we use inside the organization that have brought us success in the past, that we are comfortable with, become routines that we do not want to question. And that is something that we have to do if we're going to address a sustainability agenda. The relationships that we have inside organizations and with third parties become shackles that don't allow us to do what it is that we need to do. Some of those relationships need to evolve, some of those relationships need to be broken, and we need to move on to new relationships. And then finally, the values that exist inside an organization that have united people, that have inspired people in the past, become dogmas that we do not question. Example, we've done a lot of work with the European Patent Office over the last uh, year and a half at Cranfield. Okay, European Patent Office are the people you send your patent application to, uh, they sit down, they go into a dark room, they take your patent application, and then about a year later, they come back and they tell you whether or not you've, uh, you, you've got something that is patentable. Okay? These people have brains the size of the planet, they like sitting in dark rooms, they, they are massively inspired by the quality of their work. They are obsessed with the quality of their judgment. Okay? Now, two things have changed in their world. All of a sudden, you people that are putting patent applications in want people to do it relatively quickly. Okay, so timeliness becomes important. And also, your patent applications are becoming more and more complex. So it is beyond. Even these, I promise you, these guys are geniuses. Okay, it's beyond the gift of one person and they have to work collaboratively with their colleagues, with people who've got similar sized brains, not with halfwits. Okay? Like me. Okay? So, the issue then becomes the value of quality, which is the thing that they live and die for, is being challenged by timeliness, is being challenged by collaboration. But if we don't do that, if we don't challenge that value, we're not going to be able to meet the, the requirements of our stakeholders, and people will go elsewhere for the patent application. So for me, I think we need to think about the drivers of active inertia inside our organization with respect to a sustainability agenda, okay? Not because I think that they are problems that exist in every organization, just because I think it's a useful framework to think about how do I drive this sustainability agenda further in my organization.